Hello there. This week's technical video, I'm going to talk about a potentially quite controversial topic, certainly one that seems to incite some very strong opinions from people, and that's file formats. I'm only going to talk about JPEG and RAW, the two most common ones you'll find in most serious cameras, and all I'm really going to do is try and give you as good an overview as I can of their pros and cons. I'm not really trying to incite any controversy here. Anyway, let's get stuck in. So let's delve into the fun and exciting world of file formats and workflow. Now, most cameras, most compact cameras, smartphones, uh, will only shoot in a file format called JPEG. You're probably very familiar with JPEGs, you've probably sent them to people. Uh, they're extremely common, uh, probably the most common file format of images on the planet. And they have the advantage that they can be very, very easily shared and very, very quickly distributed. And they're also fairly small and compact as a file size. Now, advanced compacts like this and DSLRs will also shoot in JPEG, but they will let you shoot in what's called RAW mode as well. Now, RAW mode, like the name implies, is the RAW data straight from the sensor. Now, this makes for a much bigger file size generally, usually three to four times as large, but the advantages tend to be much, much higher quality. And of course, we're not mucking about here, we're all about higher quality. Great, you think to yourself, I've got my lovely new DSLR, I'll buy a big, fat, large memory card and just shoot in RAW all the time. Now, full disclosure, that's what I do. But you know what's coming, don't you, by now? There's a catch. In fact, there's two catches. The problem with RAW mode is that it can only be accessed by a certain software. You can view the images on your camera, okay, um, but you can't share them without first converting them from that RAW file format into a more common format like JPEG or TIFF or PSD. That obviously adds a stage to the processing. It means that if you want to get something off here when you're shooting in RAW and you want to get it online quickly, it's first got to go to a laptop or a computer and be converted. That obviously adds a level of delay to things. And if you're shooting quite a lot, that can become an issue. And if you need to deliver images quickly, that can become an issue. The second problem is that there are, in fact, dozens, if not hundreds, of different types of RAW format. Uh, not just different for each camera, camera manufacturer, say Nikon or Canon or Panasonic, but even within each camera model. And often, if a new camera comes out, it can be a couple of months before the RAW editing software catches up with that. Uh, so you may find you buy a brand spanking new camera the, the week it's released and you shoot in RAW and you can't even open the files just yet. So unfortunately there are catches to using RAW, but I still use it all the time for reasons we're about to go into. On the positive side however, and the reason that people like myself use RAW, besides the overall image quality improvement you get because you're not using a compressed file format, is the fact that the RAW conversion process allows you a bit of a safety net and a lot more control. This will vary from program to program, depending on what software you use. But generally speaking, anything that you can do in most modern edit image editing programs, so as adjusting exposure, adjusting white balance, contrast, color and saturation, all those sort of things can be done inside the raw conversion process. So you can work on your raw file, make these adjustments, and then process out any number of different versions. You can process out a JPEG version at lower resolution, a full resolution TIFF, etc., etc., etc. You can make all these adjustments. And what's quite wonderful is you're not doing anything to the original file. Okay, the way raw conversion software works is that it's making these adjustments, but the raw file is remaining untouched. So you've always got this safe master file tucked away on your hard drive. No matter what you might do to it, you might desaturate it fully, apply loads of contrast, and then spit out images that look like that. The original file won't be affected. It's non-destructive editing. Very, very useful for a professional workflow. So of course, if you don't like what you've done, you can undo everything and you've still got that untouched raw file sitting there waiting for you to start all over again. Most raw conversion software also allows you to copy and paste these adjustments you've made. And this can be a godsend if you've been shooting a lot in similar circumstances. Uh, you may, for example, have been shooting in a studio like this and you apply adjustments to the first image, but you know that the next 20 or so images need exactly the same adjustments. Well, a few quick clicks and there they are, all updated, saves you an enormous amount of time. Now there are several different raw conversion programs out there. Uh, the three most common ones are probably Capture One, Adobe Lightroom, and Adobe Camera Raw. Uh, I have got by far the most experience using Lightroom, although I've used the other two as well, including also some much older programs. Um, I'm not on a kickback from Adobe, although I bloody well ought to be, uh, but you can currently get Lightroom and Photoshop 
via the Creative Cloud for less than £10 a month, which is an extremely good deal. Uh, unfortunately, I can't take advantage of that because I need video editing software to do the sort of videos I'm doing today, along with the rest of my professional work. So I have to spend a lot more money. But if you only want to do Photoshop and Lightroom, £10 a month, happy days. Now, returning to JPEGs, they're still probably perfectly decent quality. Okay, And as we know, they produce a smaller file size and they're much easier to share and get out the camera quickly. You'll probably have the option within your camera to choose uh, different resolutions of JPEG to shoot, so large or medium or small, and also different amounts of compression. Now, it can be very tempting to think, oh, I'll, I'll reduce the resolution and I'll increase the compression. I'll get thousands of images on my memory card. But remember what we've said a few times, memory cards aren't expensive and you will regret further down the line shooting something at very, very small resolution and then as time passes thinking, oh, oh, I need a higher resolution version of that because don't forget, of course, if you've got lots of resolution, you can easily crop into it to make a smaller image. But if you're starting with a smaller image and trying to make it bigger, the quality will fall apart quite rapidly. Okay? I strongly suggest, even if you're shooting JPEG, let alone RAW, where you generally don't get the choice to choose different resolutions, that you stay at the highest resolution you can. I also suggest you use the minimum amount of compression. The range of options varies from very small resolution to very high resolution, or full resolution, or whatever your sensor will produce, along with not much compression through to full compression. Okay, so for the smallest file size as possible, you'll have very small resolution and lots of compression. And for larger file sizes, but much better quality, you'll have full resolution and a minimum amount of compression. Okay, those are the options you've got to play with with JPEGs. Now, a bit of insight for you, because you may see this happening. JPEG compression works by the computer and the software or processor inside your camera examining every single pixel in an image and comparing neighboring pixels to each other and the closer they are in terms of information on them the more information it discards it's what's called a lossy compression method a clever name what that means is that for areas of your image that look as if they are of a similar tone so let's say a blue sky if you add a lot of compression via a jpeg compression the sky can end up looking really, really ugly because the computer will go, oh, this is all just blue. Now, of course, it's not. It's lots of very careful graduations of blue, but as far as the computer's concerned, they're very close in detail, so discard lots of information, make the file size smaller, but what you create is this banding that you can see here in this image if you push JPEG compression too far. So I'll just quickly sum up the differences between the two main file formats you'll have. A raw format is going to give you a larger image file size, but it's going to be the best quality you can get from the camera. You can't share raw files. You can only open them in certain software, but the conversion process through that software allows you to make all sorts of edits to the images, which you can then put out in different forms as JPEGs, TIFFs, etc., etc., black and white, desaturated, whatever you might want, without damaging the original files. JPEGs, by comparison, give you a much smaller file size. Uh, you can share them immediately because they are readable by almost every device going and almost every computer going and web browsers. The drawback is they do have some compression on them. Now, at minimum compression, at full resolution, you'll barely notice this. But firstly, if you muck around with them a lot in image editing software, they'll start to fall apart quite quickly because the compression is built into the image. And secondly, if you do start to compress them heavily, image quality will degrade very rapidly. So my general advice would be, as far as file formats go, always shoot with the highest quality you can get. Don't forget, memory cards aren't that expensive. You shouldn't be limited by the fact that, oh, I've only bought a tiny little two gigabyte memory card. I can't fit many pictures on here. I'll just shoot really small JPEGs with high compression. Go and buy a decent memory card. Shoot in the best quality you can. Now, when you're just starting out, I admit that adding raw conversion to the learning process is an extra step to learn. So to begin with, I'd suggest just shooting in JPEG, but I'd stick to maximum resolution and minimum compression so you've got the best quality possible. As soon as you feel more comfortable and you've got hold of the software, start shooting in RAW and JPEG if your camera will let you. Uh, eventually, like me, you'll just shoot in RAW because you don't need the extra JPEGs. You can create what you want from the RAWs, but it's a nice gentle learning curve if you shoot RAW and JPEG in your camera because that way it's spitting out two versions of the same file. You've got the RAW there for ultimate quality, but if you want an immediate image for sharing or you just can't handle RAW conversion software, you've got a JPEG as well. Right, hope that was helpful. 
Uh, as you probably know, this video is part of a much bigger technical fundamentals course. You can see the playlist below where you can delve into all the basic aspects of the technical side of photography. Uh, you know how YouTube works. Hit like if you like what you're seeing, subscribe, all that sort of thing. And I'll see you next week for another video.